This is chapter 8, Pathophysiology. So we spoke a little bit in the previous lecture about cellular function and the fact that cells need oxygen to operate. And when someone is low on oxygen, cells can be damaged and even, uh, even die. But normal, healthy cellular function is, is performed in an anaerobic state, which means it's with oxygen. So the cells function, uh, they do whatever they do. They contract like cardiac cells or they flex or whatever they do to keep you going. And a byproduct of that cellular function in this normal, healthy, aerobic state is it produces heat, carbon dioxide, and water as byproducts or waste products. Now, one of the reasons why we are warm to the touch, why our body temperature is 98.6, is because of this heat being produced by our cellular function. Our byproduct is carbon dioxide, and as you remember, carbon dioxide is, ex is exhaled through the lungs. It's a waste product that we try not to retain more than we need, and of course, there's water. So what happens with aerobic metabolism, glucose and oxygen enter the cell, and the mitochondria, which is that kind of brown looking thing, uh, takes those two substances, those two molecules, and they break them down. And in the process, they create what's called pyruvic acid. And that pyruvic acid is used as an energy source, and it, it produces what's called moles of energy. And those few moles of energy um, stimulate the cell to produce more energy. And what you're getting here is, is adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. And ATP is really the fuel that runs the cell. But to produce ATP, the cell has to have glucose and oxygen to mix together to create that adenosine triphosphate. If the cell has enough moles of energy and it produces enough ATP, then the cell functions. And usually by functioning, I mean the walls of the cell, there's channels in the walls of the cell, and these will open, and through these channels will go ions, calcium ions, sodium ions, potassium ions, whatever the cell needs, whatever it's doing. and by allowing these ions to be pumped out or pumped in or whatever the cell might be doing, it allows the cell to perform its function and it's acting normally. Remember, the byproduct of this normal, healthy aerobic metabolism is heat, carbon dioxide, and water. So now with anaerobic metabolism, you have a person who is severely hypoxic. Remember, hypoxia is a state of low oxygen levels in the tissues. This could be for medical reasons, could be trauma, could be blood loss, but there's just not enough oxygen to allow the cells to function. So now there's glucose going into the cells because more than likely this person has normal levels of glucose in their body, but they're low in oxygen. So when the cell tries to function, it's missing out on that one molecule of, of oxygen, and the process is interrupted. So now you have a cell that has glucose going into the, into the structure, but there's no oxygen. So even though the glucose will break down, you'll get glycolysis, there's no oxygen to complete the process. You, you don't get enough moles of energy to kickstart that production of adenosine triphosphate, the ATP. So now the cell can't function. And because the pyruvic acid never gets converted, uh, as in a normal cellular function, it turns then into lactic acid, which is highly acidic. And remember, uh, high acid states, uh, people who become acidotic, cells don't function very well in these states. So what happens is the cell doesn't, the channels don't open, the 
the ions don't transfer effectively and eventually the cell dies. So what I've been talking about the last couple of minutes in the walls of the cell is these again these cell walls have these channels and in most cases they use something called the sodium potassium pump sodium and potassium are ions in our body we have to retain a certain amount of sodium potassium in our body for our cells to function properly but you can see where um, sodium is predominantly inside the cell and potassium is predominantly outside the cell and when the cell functions normally the channels open up and the cell uses the adenosine triphosphate, the energy, to pump the sodium out of the cell. And then potassium flows in kind of passively. And this process of these two ions transferring th across the cell membrane causes the cell to perform its function, to do whatever it does. But let's say the cell doesn't have any oxygen. So those channels don't open properly. It does not have the energy to pump sodium out. So the sodium stays inside the cell walls. It stays inside the cell. And sodium keeps building up and building up and building up. And, and now inside the cell, is, there's super high concentrations of sodium. Whereas outside the cell, it's low concentrations of sodium. I mean, any, any, bio major or anyone who has been through any kind of uh, class on this will tell you if you have a if you have sodium uh, a low concentration on one side of a membrane and high concentrations of sodium on the other side of the membrane what the body wants to do is it wants to, to dilute that high concentration of sodium so what it does in this case is it floods the cell with fluid with water essentially to, to dilute the sodium to make it equal to the outside. Well what happens is the cell swells up and the wall of the cell ruptures and then once the cell wall ruptures the cell has died and all the the uh, mitochondria and the nuclei and all the little structures inside the cell that makes it what it is if they just float away and now the cell is dead. This is called lysing of the cells. When the cell ruptures due to the swelling, it's called lysing of the cells. So like we mentioned uh, during the anatomy and physiology lecture, there are certain situations that can lead to states of hypoxia, and these can be caused by a number of reasons, uh, blood loss, asthma attack, Inhalation of smoke or gas, uh, allergic reaction, choking, um, the list is endless. But I wanted to cover areas that are affected by these various types of conditions and how they directly or indirectly affect the perfusion of the patient. So as we talked about before, bronchial tubes have smooth muscle in the middle layer and this smooth muscle, this involuntary muscle group, allows the bronchial tubes to relax and constrict depending on the needs of the body. These bronchial tubes also have mucous membranes that can secrete mucus. So when people have asthma attacks, what can happen is the asthma attack leads to a increased production of mucus, which causes a partial blockage of the bronchial tubes, the irritation from whatever is causing the asthma attack can lead to bronchoconstriction, and ultimately what it all leads to is an increased airway resistance. Like we, we talked about earlier, when the brainstem recognizes that the there is increased resistance in the airway and the patient is not breathing effectively, it starts to try to correct this problem, and one of the things it does, it increases the rate and effort of their, their breathing, it leads to that labored respirations, leads to the accessory muscle use we talked about earlier. If this does not solve the problem, if the patient doesn't get to help in a reasonable amount of time, 
then what what this all leads to is as that carbon dioxide builds up in the bloodstream and builds up in the tissues, the person becomes acidotic. Their pH levels drop. And also at the same time, because they can't get oxygen into their bloodstream as effectively as they normally can, they become hypoxic. Okay, so the reason why we're so concerned about reduced compliance in the lungs and increased resistance is because this bronchoconstriction and this increased secretions caused by the, the condition the patient's going through, whether it's asthma attack or allergic reaction, reduces the patient's minute volume. Now, the definition of minute volume is the amount or volume of air the patient breathes in in one minute. And how we factor that is we, we factor tidal volume. And tidal volume is the amount of air a person breathes in in one breath. And we multiply by the frequency of their breathing, how many times they breathe per minute. And if you multiply one by the other, you get minute volume. Now, on average, an adult uh, inhales about 500 milliliters of volume of air which eat with each breath. So looking at these two patients here, the, the patient on top here, this person is breathing at 500 milliliters per, uh, per breath times 12 breaths per minute, you do the multiplication, what you get is 6 liters per minute. The person at the bottom, they're having an asthma attack. And because of the bronchoconstriction and the increased secretions, they're only getting 200 milliliters of air into their lungs per breath. And because their body recognizes that they're hypoxic, it's increased this person's respiratory rate to 40 breaths per minute. But if you multiply 40 times 200, you get 8 liters of, of air entering this person's lungs. And you have to ask yourself, well, wait, wait a minute. The, the, the person there in gold, the person who's having the asthma attack, why are they in trouble? Well, the, the little secret here is that there is a dead space in our respiratory tree or tract, about 150 milliliters that never exchanges gases. So if you factor in that 150 milliliters, if you subtract it from the 500, for the healthy person, they're getting about 350 into their alveoli for gas exchange. Unfortunately, the asthmatic or the allergic reaction patient, they're only getting 50 milliliters to the alveoli. And so you can see why this person in gold here is in dire distress because even though they're taking more air in, it's not getting down into the alveoli work and exchange, uh, exchange gases. So I've, I've been talking about the uh, body's response to hypoxia, the increased respiratory rate, the increased heart rate, shunting of blood from non-vital organs to vital organs to protect the body. And how the body does this, one of its mechanisms it are these chemoreceptors. Remember, the, the, the prefix chemo would be chemical. So these are chemical receptors. And they measure predominantly two things. They measure carbon dioxide levels in your body, and they measure, measure oxygen levels as well. And it also keeps track of your pH balance. Is your pH normal or not? Your central chemoreceptor, is, local, uh, is located in your brain stem right next to your respiratory drive center. Your peripheral chemoreceptor is in your chest. It's in the top of your heart here, uh, right around the aortic arch. The central chemoreceptor is very sensitive to carbon dioxide, and it's constantly keeping track of carbon dioxide and pH balance. The peripheral chemoreceptor is most sensitive to oxygen levels. So these two structures are constantly checking and making sure that you have enough oxygen and and you only have enough carbon dioxide in your body to maintain a, a normal balance. 
when you go into the asthma attack or allergic reaction, or you get a gunshot wound to the chest, or you're losing blood, these two, these two chemical receptors start to recognize an, an imbalance. And they send messages to the brainstem to overcome, at least temporarily, these imbalances. And how it does this, it releases adrenaline, which we talked about earlier, it increases the heart rate, the contractility of the heart, uh, the automaticity of the heart. It, it uh, vasoconstricts the blood vessels to shunt blood to the more important parts of the body. It bronchodilates to get more air into the lungs, if that's a possibility anyway. And it does a lot of different things to try to maintain this person's life. So it's really important that you guys understand chemoreceptors. You should also understand where they are in the body and what each one does. So normally a healthy person breathes because of high concentrations of carbon dioxide in their bloodstream. This is called a hypercarbic drive. Now, I'm sure that you've been at some time in your life sitting down, reading a book, maybe listening to my lecture. You're getting a little sleepy. You're getting a little bored. Maybe you're not breathing quite as deeply as you normally would. Not that you're aware of this, but your chemoreceptors are. And your central chemoreceptor, which is sensitive to carbon dioxide, recognizes that you have a higher than normal level of carbon dioxide in your bloodstream, and it wants to get rid of it. So it sends a message to your brainstem and says, you need to take a deep breath. And this comes out in a form of a yawn. You ever wonder why you yawn? It's not because you're bored. It's because you're, you haven't been breathing very deeply in whatever you're doing and your body wants to eliminate its carbon dioxide. So healthy people breathe because of high carbon dioxide levels. They want to get rid of it. Now, in certain populations of patients, they have just the opposite situation. And this pre predominantly is in the patients who are long-term smokers. Someone's been smoking cigarettes, pipes, or tobacco products for many, many, many years. Uh, they've damaged their cilia, they've damaged the alveoli, they've damaged their lungs. And in the process, they've trapped carbon dioxide in their bloodstream. They cannot exchange gases as effectively as a healthy person. And their carbon dioxide levels rise and they can't get rid of it. So over a period of long, long period of time, uh, this desensitizes your central chemoreceptor. So your central chemoreceptor no longer is sensitive to carbon dioxide. It can no longer tell your brainstem to take a breath. So these patients like emphysemics, like chronic bronchitis patients, they have a fallback mechanism, and this is called the hypoxic drive. And remember, they, there's two chemoreceptors. Uh, this person's already knocked out their central, so now all that's left is their peripheral chemoreceptor. And as we know already, the peripheral is sensitive mostly to oxygen. So the reason why this person breathes, the emphysemic breathes, is because they're low on oxygen. And you will see a lot of, as EMTs, paramedics, whatever you do in the field, doctors, nurses, you'll see a lot of emphysemics and a lot of people with COPD. And these people chronically have low oxygen levels in their body. And this is the only reason why they take a breath. So the reason why we're concerned about this is that if we were to inadvertently, unnecessarily, provide them with high concentrations of supplemental oxygen, and we were to hypersaturate their tissues and their bloodstream with higher than normal concentrations of oxygen, which could be done over a period of time, then technically the the peripheral chemoreceptor would say, hey, I don't need to do anything because we have plenty of oxygen. And ultimately, this person could stop breathing because they no longer have that drive to take a breath. Luckily for us, uh, this takes hours and hours to occur. And it's unlikely as an EMT or a paramedic or a doctor or a nurse for us to see this in a pre-hospital environment. Now, this is mostly seen in uh, when people that are, that are on ventilators or a long-term oxygen therapy.
So we've been discussing respiration and ventilation, and we've been talking about the need for proper perfusion, proper blood flow back to the lungs, and the proper amount of volume of air into the lungs. But now we're going to put a name to that, and it's called the ventilation perfusion ratio. And just to remind you again, is if there's not enough volume of air entering the lungs, you're not going to get proper gas exchange. And conversely, if there's not enough blood flow getting back to the lungs due to uh, blood loss or states of shock, you're not going to have proper proper perfusion of the gases, the carbon dioxide and the oxygen, and this patient will become hypercarbic, uh, increased carbon dioxide levels, and they'll become hypoxic. And so either one of these two situations can lead to, of course, a state of hypoperfusion, or if you want to call it, shock. So when it comes to blood volume, blood volume is proportional to the mass of the patient. So the bigger the patient, the, the more blood volume the body has. As you can see, an infant has 12, 13, 15 ounces of blood in, in their body. A young child might have a couple of liters. Uh, a fully grown female might have four liters. A fully grown male might have five or up to six liters. It really comes down to body mass. The reason why we we think about this is because, as you learned from the anatomy lecture, that the heart pumps your entire blood volume in approximately one minute. So in a worst case scenario, if you were to unfortunately have your carotid artery or a large artery lacerated, you could bleed out you could lose most of your blood volume in less than a minute. So when we see people bleeding externally and blood's coming out of a wound, this is why we want to stop all blood loss because blood is a precious, uh, precious resource for our body because it, it provides the blood pressure, the blood volume, and the ability to circulate oxygen that our body needs to survive. When it comes to the regulation of our blood pressure, our body is constantly measuring our blood pressure, constantly measuring our carbon dioxide and oxygen levels. And every minute of your life, it's making adjustments for whatever you might be doing, your, your bodily needs might be at that time. Uh, baroreceptors, now the prefix baro means pressure. This is a pressure receptors that are constantly measuring your blood pressure. If they recognize a blood pressure changes too high or too low, they can promote vasoconstriction or vasodilation to either increase the blood pressure or decrease the blood pressure. They can indirectly promote uh, increased contactility of the heart, uh, increased heart rate to increase your blood pressure or just the opposite, they can calm your heart down uh, let it beat less forcibly to reduce your blood pressure. Again, this is going on constantly, uh, all the time, behind the scenes, so to speak. There's also the chemoreceptors that, mo that again monitor the carbon dioxide as well as the oxygen and your pH levels. Now, when a person is losing blood, whether it's internal bleeding or whether it's external bleeding from a wound, uh, when the body begins to recognize uh, that the blood pressure is dropping, when the chemoreceptors recognize uh, hypoxia, then it starts to release adrenaline, and adrenaline does some really great things that we already talked about. Uh, it promotes vasoconstriction, which is going to squeeze the arteries and veins. It's going to push that blood from the non-vital organs to the vital organs to help to maintain your brain and your heart and your spleen and your liver and it it is it, it also going to increase your heart rate uh, and your contractility of your heart and the automaticity of your heart as well it will also create that 
bronchodilation, which will hopefully get more air into your lungs, into the alveoli, and a better exchange of gases at the alveolar level. And this is why when someone is losing blood, if it's external bleeding, like in a wound, our primary goal is to stop that bleeding with direct pressure or even a tourniquet if necessary. Once we get that bleeding stopped, we're going to treat this person for shock. Uh, high flow oxygen uh, via some type of mask, uh, lay them down in, in a supine position, which means on their back, keep them warm with blankets, and then rapidly transport them to them to an appropriate hospital. If the bleeding is internal that we can't get to, uh, then only a physician can stop that bleeding. So the highest priority right now is rapid transport to an appropriate hospital uh, that can treat this person's condition. We're still going to keep them warm. We're still going to lay them down on their back. We're still going to provide them with high flow oxygenation, but uh, the biggest goal here is rapidly get them to a hospital. Once they're at the hospital, the doctor will stop the bleeding, and then the person will, will be provided with whole red blood to uh, replace what they've lost. So we talked in the anatomy physiology lecture about pulmonary edema. We talked about congestive heart failure, the right side versus the left side. And I wanted to kind of explain the mechanism behind this. So in our blood vessels, both the arteries and veins, we have these two mechanisms that try to keep the pressure inside these vessels uh, within normal ranges. When these vessels start to overstretch, then the body tries to release this extra fluid, this plasma. So these plasma proteins, the, remember the plasma is a liquid uh, that everything floats in in your bloodstream. It's the, it's the water in your bloodstream, basically. So hydrostatic pressure inside your, your blood vessels, it wants to, it wants to push out the, the excess fluid. And the excess fluid escapes out through the capillaries and that water winds up in the surrounding tissue as edema. And this is when you start getting that pitting edema to the ankles or the fluid in their lungs that leads to left-sided heart failure and pulmonary edema. So hydrostatic pressure tries to push out the extra fluids and oncotic pressure tries to keep it in. So these two forces are constantly working together, so to speak, to maintain normal pressure inside your, your veins and arteries. So how your body regulates your heart rate is through two mechanisms. One is the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, that's your fight and flight response. It uses adrenaline. When your body perceives a, a need to increase your heart rate, maybe you're doing something exertional like running or jumping or climbing stairs or arguing or whatever it might be, uh, it releases adrenaline, which simulates the heart to beat faster, stronger, and pump more blood around more quickly. When you go to relax, you're sitting down, you're resting, you're reading a book, you're watching TV, your body perceives there's less need for blood. So it simulates the parasympathetic system to stimulate the 10th cranial nerve which is also known as the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve uh, controls the sinoatrial node. As you remember, the sinoatrial node is called the pacemaker of the heart. And if you innervate the sinoatrial node, uh, what it does is it slows down your heartbeat. So now you have a calmer heart, a slower heart, because you're not doing anything exertional. You don't need that extra flow of blood. You're doing fine. Now, two terms you need to be aware of. One is called tachycardia, and the other is called bradycardia. Tachycardia is any heartbeat over 100 beats per minute, and bradycardia is any heartbeat less than 60 beats per minute. And I know there are athletes that routinely have heart rates below 60, uh, bicycle racers and soccer players and triathletes and I, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking 
people would have sick hearts. The same thing with tachycardia. You can you can have a heart rate of 120 because you have a fever or you're mad or you're running. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about someone with a sick heart that have grossly high heart rates, 160, 180, 200, 240. I've seen them as high as 280 beats per minute. But the problem with this, with these grossly high heart rates, is it reduces the amount of fluid or blood getting into the ventricles. This is called ventricular fill time. So if the heart's beating at 200 beats per minute, it's beating so quickly, the ventricles don't get a chance to fully fill, then less blood is ejected from the heart and it drops the blood pressure. So it's kind of an inverse proportion here. The faster the heart rate goes, the less blood is ejected. So there's a tipping point there where now this person, his whole body is affected by this, this somehow sick heart or this heart that's being abused by uh, methamphetamines. So we talked about the uh, ventricular fill time and how much blood that gets into the ventricle is directly proportional to how much has been ejected. The amount of blood that is ejected with each contraction of the left ventricle is called stroke volume. Now this is about 70 cc's of blood for an adult. And it's determined by what's called preload. You need to know the definition of preload. Preload is the amount of blood returning back from the lungs and that's in the left ventricle just prior to the ventricle contracting. So this is the blood that's come back from the body. It's gone through the right side of the heart. It's gone to the lungs. It's been reoxygenated. Carbon dioxide has been dropped off. It's gone back through the lungs, back to the left side of the heart, goes into the left atria, goes down into the left ventricle. It hasn't, it's just filled up, it hasn't, it's filled up the ventricle, but it hasn't contracted yet. This is preload. The more blood that gets into the left ventricle, the more blood is ejected. So if someone's preload drops due to blood loss because they've cut themselves or they've gone into shock and their blood pressure has dropped, then less blood will get into the ventricles and less blood will be ejected. So it will further drop their, their, their blood pressure as well. So we're concerned about preload. So know the definition of preload. It's the amount of blood in the left ventricle just prior to the ventricle contracting. Now, afterload, afterload is the pressure that the left ventricle pumps against. Afterload is, is found in the uh, aortic arch, the aorta. This is your this is your uh, this is your arterial pressure inside your arteries. Uh, doctors are really concerned about chronic hypertension because people with uh, increased plaque in their bloodstream, people with hardening in the arteries, they have hypertension and the left ventricle has to pump very, very hard against this extra resistance to pump body uh, blood around the body. So this is why doctors are concerned about people with chronic hypertension. Eventually, if the, the left ventricle has to pump so hard against this increased blood pressure inside the arteries, it over a period of years, it wears out. And finally, the heart will go into heart failure due to this this extra exertion over a long period of time. Uh, another process you need to be aware of is called Frank Starling's Law. And we've been talking about the atria and how it contracts, but the purpose of the atria is to provide atrial kick. And Frank Starling's Law says that if you overstretch the, the left ventricle muscle, uh, it will pump more effect effectively. So what happens is, is blood comes back to the left side of the heart, it pours into the atria, it pours into the, into the left ventricle, the left ventricle fills, and then just prior to, to the left ventricle contracting, the left atria contracts, and it forces an extra dose of blood into the ventricle. It forces the, the muscles of the heart to overstretch. 
And Frank Starling's law states that if you overstretch a muscle, it will more forcibly contract. And Frank Starling's law, this atrial kick, is what really makes your normal healthy heart efficient. If you didn't have atrial kick, you would not be able to pump blood as effectively and efficiently as, as you do and be able to circulate that whole blood volume in your body in that one minute time period. There are some people that no longer have atrial kick. This is the elderly population. There's a small percentage of, of, of the elderly population, the geriatric population that have atrial fibrillation. That rhythm strip up there you see in the picture, that's atrial fibrillation. And the atria, the upper chambers of the heart are no longer contracting effectively. So this patient does not have atrial kick. So ultimately what this means is they're pumping less blood out of their heart with each contraction. So their stroke volume has, has dropped. So the way the body compensates for this is it increases the heart rate and to try to get more blood out. But you can see there's a problem with this. If you have a person who's 70 years old, 80 years old, and their heart is already pumping at 90 beats per minute to try to compensate for this lack of this atrial kick, and this person gets into a car accident and they rupture their spleen or their liver or they're losing blood in some way, and the body goes to try to co compensate for this blood loss by increasing the heart rate, by trying to increase the contractility of the heart, by causing vasoconstriction, okay, by trying to increase the preload, because of this lack of atrial kick, the heart's not going to be able to maintain enough pressure and it's not going to be able to compensate for this person's shock like it would on a younger, healthier person or a person that didn't have atrial fibrillation and still had their atrial kick. So when it comes to blood pressure, uh, the way it's measured is this measured uh, based on the systolic pressure versus the diastolic pressure. So your systolic pressure is the pressure in your arteries when your left ventricle contracts. If you place your fingers on your pulse and when you feel that thump or that beat, that is your systolic pressure. Between each beat would be your diastolic pressure. And the diastolic pressure is the systemic vascular resistance inside your arteries. This is what your left ventricle pumps against. So if you if you look at these, the way the, the heart is pumping, it's cardiac output, and how, how much resistance there is in, in the arteries will determine your blood pressure. So if you have a lot of resistance in your arteries due to plaque development, and due to uh, hardening of the arteries, which is the both aging processes, uh, you're, you're going to have a higher than normal blood pressure. If you have healthy blood vessels, but your heart's pumping really hard and really fast, it's going to increase your blood pressure. If your heart slows down and calms down, it's going to decrease your, 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 uh, your blood pressure. So you have a situation where if you have smaller blood vessels caused by vasoconstriction for one reason or another, or you have vasodilation, it's going to affect your blood pressure. If you have vasoconstriction, it's going to increase your blood pressure. If you have vasodilation, it's going to decrease your blood pressure because it makes the veins larger. So just to remind you, systemic vascular resistance is the resistance in the arteries that the left ventricle of the heart pumps against. And it's affected by things like vasoconstriction and vasodilation. If you vasoconstrict your arteries, there's more resistance. If you vasodilate, there's less resistance that your heart pumps against. And this, this difference between these two numbers, the systolic higher number and the diastolic lower number, uh, is your pulse pressure and determining a person's pulse pressure can tell us a lot about what might be going on with the patient's situation.
So the definition of pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressures. So you can see here, 120 over 80, if you do the math, the difference is 40. And so that would be the person's pulse pressure. And this is pretty much al aligned with what is normal. And the normal pulse pressure is usually about one third of the person's systolic pressure. Now we do encounter patients that have widened pulse pressures and also narrowed pulse pressures as well. Now one of the common reasons for a wider than normal pulse pressure is a head injury. The brain is injured, the brain stem is affected, and we know that, that the brain stem controls things like blood pressure and vasoconstriction and vasodilation and all those things that keep you alive. And what happens, unfortunately, is the brainstem is malfunctioning and it's trying to do one thing and the peripheral nervous system, the rest of the body, is trying to do another thing and they are kind of fighting each other. And what comes out of all this is, is you get a higher than normal systolic blood pressure and a lower than normal diastolic, which leads to a widened pulse pressure. So if you encounter someone who has been hit in the head or some kind of accident that when they struck their head and this person has an altered mental status and their blood pressure is really wide, as you see here, then it's an indication that they could have a very serious brain injury. Now, narrowed pulse pressure, uh, the most common thing that we see in the field is uh, occurs when the person is going into shock. Uh, this person is losing blood. And as we know already, when a person's losing blood, the body responds by releasing adrenaline. And one of the things that the body does with the adrenaline is it increases the heart rate and increases the cardiac output, and it also causes vasoconstriction. So what happens initially during the early stages of shock is the person's blood pressure artificially goes up. So rather than 120 over 80, uh, due to this response by the nervous system, their blood pressure is now 130 over 90, say. So it's artificially maintaining this higher than normal blood pressure to try to keep this person alive. Well, if the person is still losing blood, then what's going to happen is, is the lower number, the diastolic number, is going to stay 90 because it's being held up by the vasoconstriction caused by the adrenaline, but as the pressure, as the blood loss continues, the upper pressure starts to drop. So the 130 starts to drop, 130, 115, 120, 110, and now these pressures come together. You've narrowed these pressures together, and now the pulse pressure is only 20, half of what it's supposed to be. So again, this is an indication that this person is going into decompensated shock because his body's having problems compensating for this blood loss or the blood loss hasn't stopped and a narrowed pulse pressure is a sign of someone going into shock from blood loss. And we're done with uh, chapter eight.